In order to gain and regain the confidence of the world, we need to have, we have to prove again that America says what it means and means what it says. I mean, bloody hell, that's just sort of idiosyncratic, empty rhetoric. That might as well be in the cat in the hat saying that. You ain't getting a gig these days. Hello all of you, today we're talking about Joe Biden and the forever wars. In particular, the ongoing bombing of Middle Eastern nations and his relationship with Saudi Arabia. Let's take a look. Spoiler alert, you're not going to think, oh this is all much better now. Now we're watching some breaking news tonight. Joe Biden has made his first big military move, launching airstrikes against a target in Syria. After just over a month in office, Joe Biden ordered his first bombing campaign with airstrikes targeting Iranian-backed fighters in Syria. The US strikes killed 22 people. The action was retaliation for the militia strikes in Iraq last week. Retaliation? That can't be the motivation. I literally tell my children not to do that. The Defense Department said the operation sends an unambiguous message that the president will act to protect American coalition personnel. Diane Randall said, no matter the justification or number of casualties, the Syria bombing was contrary to President Biden's election commitment to end forever wars. It's long past time we end the forever wars, which have cost us untold blood and treasure. The deadly cycle continues apace. War in Iraq, war in Syria, war in Afghanistan, war in Yemen, war in Libya, war in Somalia. After 20 years, the government is now conducting militarized counterterrorism operations in 85 countries. The Pentagon says he ordered the strike earlier Thursday and described it as a proportionate military response. It's a weird piece of diplomatic language, a proportionate military response. That's 22 human beings' lives have ended, but perhaps even more significant is the indication that there is a, just a continuation of a long prevailing mentality that the US government has a global role that permits them to enforce their policies and intentions across sovereign nations, always under the guise of goodness. Concerning for me, too, as someone from another country who watched that election unfold and the civil strife that it brought to the surface, to observe, well, all that argument took place in a space of distinction that doesn't include the bombing of other countries. So what is it that we expect and want from a president? And if it doesn't include moral and ethical conduct abroad, then what are our own values? The top Republican on the U.S. Foreign Affairs Committee writing, responses like these are a necessary deterrent. Many Democrats also supportive. Tomas Piercyanek says, Biden's administration includes hawks from the Obama era and other disciples of imperialism. A return to the hope and change era of President Obama, who bombed seven countries in six years. It heralds a return to business as usual, where Wall Street and large corporations dictate domestic policy while the State Department and Pentagon spearhead America's imperialist ambitions abroad. Like these slogans, hope, change, honesty, end the forever wars, they should mean something. But some lawmakers questioning whether the president has the legal authority to act without congressional consent. Democratic Senator Tim Kaine writing, offensive military action without congressional approval is not constitutional, absent extraordinary circumstances. There you are. I suppose we're already now in a conversation where, you know, military action without congressional approval seems like it's something that's problematic. I don't want to seem like I'm venting against people that are optimistic about, you know, Joe Biden or anything like that, because I'm sure everyone wants what's sort of best in their heart of hearts. But that optimism cannot blind us to the reality that regardless of who is in power, you're still going to see, you know, unconstitutional activity, bombing of foreign countries. James Risen writes, the military industrial complex tend to support expansionist American national security and foreign policies. Since 9-11, they've pushed for a continuation of American military involvement in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. They are driven by greed and power. They believe that endless war is good for business. It is good for business. That, that belief is true. I mean, because I suppose people have got to make stuff and sell stuff and do things. Again, a little bit like what we're saying about the pandemic. If a policy or idea or state suits the interests of the powerful, it's very difficult to change it. 
America has become accustomed to a permanent state of war. That's true, isn't it? And again, people talk about, um, like, evoke George Orwell in particular in 1984 when we talk about the surveillance state, but also an important component of that surveillance state was a continuing um, state of fear and a continuing state of war, of enmity towards a, a sort of an abstract, often unnamed other to facilitate these uh, measures at home. I suppose these ideas aren't separate. We shouldn't, should we, look at Biden's actions abroad as abstract. Oh, it don't matter. He's doing that in the Middle East. That's not people in our countries. We should be, well, hold on a minute. What are we voting for? What do we believe in? Who are these people? What are their intentions? And if you want to look at it from a you know selfish perspective, if that's how their foreign policy plays out, what is likely to happen when it comes to their use of data mining, their uh, deals with big tech companies. Only a small slice of society, including many poor and rural teenagers, fight and die, while a permanent national security elite rotates among senior government posts, contracting companies, think tanks and television commentary, opportunities that would disappear if America was suddenly at peace. To most of America, war has become not only tolerable, but profitable, and so there is no longer any great incentive to end it. So with foreign policy, forever wars and bombing, it's pretty clear that Biden is business as usual. Let's look at the pledges he made around America's controversial relationship with Saudi Arabia, a nation known for human rights infringements and many other ideas. You don't have to look around for too long to see some pretty disturbing stuff. But also, of course, there was that murder of that journalist sanctioned by the Crown Prince. Let's see what Biden said and then what Biden did and then draw your own conclusions. Mr. Vice President, the CIA has concluded that the leader of Saudi Arabia directed the murder of U.S.-based journalist Jamal Khashoggi. President Trump has not punished senior Saudi leaders. <coughs> would you? Yes. Yes. And I would make it very clear we were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. Yeah. Make them the pariah that they are. President Biden is facing growing criticism for failing to sanction Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Joe Biden has defended his decision to waive any punishment for Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince in the murder of a US-based journalist. He's waived that. <laughs> He's wafted it out. He was very passionate on the telly. Yeah, but I, I had to say that then. There's very little social redeeming value of the, in the present uh, government in Saudi Arabia. It's starting to seem like you say certain things when you're campaigning and do other stuff when you're in government. What does that make you? A regular politician. What does that make all the hyperbole and excitement and standing up in cars and blowing up balloons and waving flags when you're elected? A bit silly. Uh, there is no actual sanctions against uh, the Crown Prince. Uh, there's no uh, travel ban, nothing, just a public naming and shaming. So it's quite short of saying we're going to make this guy a pariah. The reason that he waived it, oh. claiming that acting against the Saudi royals would have been diplomatically unprecedented for the United States. You would have been diplomatically unprecedented when you said that. Sometimes you have to do odd stuff. If you're the president of a country, I would have thought, oh, I didn't realize that being president of a country might involve diplomatically complex situations. Oh, I'll tell you what, mate. Don't be the president then. If you want an easy job, go and get a job at a farmer's market. Oh, I didn't realize that working at this farmer's market would involve selling fruit and veg at inflated prices just on the basis that it's organic. Well, it does, Joe. That's what farmer's markets are. The Washington Post contributor was considered a fierce critic of the kingdom and frequently condemned the country's human rights abuses. Jeffrey Fields, associate professor of the practice of international relations, said, like his predecessors, Biden is grappling with the reality. <laughs> Saudi Arabia is needed to achieve certain US objectives in the Middle East. Welcome to politics, everyone. Welcome to politics. Like those of you that were uh, jumping around and dancing about, this is the deal, right? Change, hope, these empty words clanging like trash cans in the campaigns have no meaning, no resonance if they are not followed up by action. I posit that in order to get that action, you require serious, systemic change, not superficial, artificial, let's feel a bit better about ourselves for half hour change. Press Secretary Jen Psaki addressed some of the criticism during an interview yesterday. Our objective is to recalibrate the relationship, prevent this from ever happening again. Recalibrating a relationship just means 
realigning it and getting it working again. That's what recalibration means. Like once you've recalibrated them, you've essentially said kill as many journalists as you want. We're not going to do anything about it. And find ways as there are still to work together with Saudi leadership while still making clear where we feel action is unacceptable. What that is is placatory rhetoric, isn't it? You've just found yourself in a position where you said you were going to do one thing, you did another thing, the very thing most people would have assumed you would have done. Don't you think in your own personal life when you sort of feel like something's going to happen and then that thing does happen, you have a particular sinking feeling in your gut, don't you? Like, oh man, I knew that was going to happen. And then look into the face of those people and ask, how can I trust you now? Because my sense is that whilst you make, may make superficial pledges and rhetorical gestures towards civil rights and change, ultimately things will remain exactly the same. And in particular, nothing will ever be allowed to happen that could penetrate the sphere of interests that are at the heart of power. Those will be protected at all costs, even if that means flying directly in the face of promises made on the campaign trail. Do you think that change and hope lie in this direction, or is it simply business as usual, more of the same? A dancing President Trump made Saudi Arabia his first foreign trip. Trump and other White House officials reminded critics at the time that Saudi Arabia buys billions of dollars in weapons from the US. President Obama went to Saudi Arabia and met the king despite profound reservations about its human rights record. President Obama, though, visited Saudi Arabia more than any other American president four times in eight years. I'm laughing at myself because I still, if I see Barack Obama talking on telly, I still think, oh, he seems so nice and he's so cool and like, his wife's on Netflix and it all seems cool and nice and good and how you want the world to be. But I'm so sorry. We have to accept reality visited Saudi Arabia more than any other American president to discuss everything from Iran to oil production. I guess what we're being slapped in the face with here is a little something called reality. Why is the United States relationship um, with Saudi Arabia so important? So for the United States, Saudi Arabia being the biggest producer of, uh, of hydrocarbons in the world is very important because the, the oil markets, the stability of the oil market, the reliability of the oil markets depends substantially on Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is also a big factor in Gulf affairs, and, and America's interest in the Middle East is anchored uh, with Saudi politics, and so stability there is important. What that sort of tells you, really, is real change is not possible, because it's, he's using words like anchored. This is the reality. So a sort of a fairer thing to do on the campaign trail would be, no, we're not going to hold that bloke to account the crown prince, will recalibrate our relationship because the reality is, and Donald Trump speaks a little bit more like that, he says that's the reality of our relationships. So whether you like Trump a lot or you dislike him intensely, what you have to acknowledge is he sort of spoke more plainly. That's the thing that's so mental about that era, that it took this peculiar person to speak in a way that chimed with people and seemed more explicit about the reality of government. For example, when he said about his relationship with Russia, you think our country's so innocent? It's weird. It's weird. I'm beyond politics is where I position myself. I wouldn't be interested in either of those outcomes. I don't think any of them are going to lead to a better life for you or for me, to tell you the truth. But I am interested when someone behaves in such a peculiar manner. They're spending $110 billion purchasing military equipment and other things. Uh, if we don't sell it to them, they'll say, well, thank you very much, we'll buy it from Russia, or thank you very much, we'll buy it from China. That doesn't help us. If the fact is that the current economic model requires those relationships with Saudi Arabia, we might as well stop lying about it, we might as well tell the truth. But, well, we can't really do anything about that, to be honest, even though it's really bad, because we've got economic ties and uh, mineral and energy ties that we simply cannot breach. But don't pretend that you're any different, just say we're the same, we're the same. The difference is not meaningful. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Please subscribe to this channel and significantly like and comment these videos. Get them sent around places and join us in the uh, conversation down there below. I respond to the comments and occasionally we do comments videos. We'll do more of them if you do a lot of comments too. Sign up for my mailing list on russellbrand.com and please consider if you've got the uh, money getting my book Revelation. It's not a book actually, it's an audible original and the links are all in the description. Do as much as you can. I'll continue to make as much free content as possible for as long as it's feasible. Thanks very much. Stay with us.